Hi, welcome to Conversations with Elizabeth Johnston. I'm Elizabeth, and today we have got a great podcast topic that I think a lot of you are going to be interested in, what you wish you had known about the narcissist in your life and how to move forward. Many of you are wondering, what has happened to this relationship in my life? You're confused. It could be a husband, it could be a friend, it could be a parent, it could be a pastor, and you're wondering, how did that train just hit me? (laughs) What just happened? And you're searching for answers. And many of you are seeing that the relation, the broken relationship you're dealing with has narcissistic traits, that the other person has narcissistic traits. And you're reading about this on social media, or you're seeing videos on YouTube, and your interest is piqued in this topic. Um, I know there are a lot of YouTube diagnoses out there for narcissism, but there is a real actual medical diagnosis and disorder. Um, I am not a doctor. I am not giving medical advice. I'm not giving any kind of advice other than just a mommy today um, who has done a lot of reading on this topic. And it's something that I am super interested in. And um, again, read some books on the topic, um, but again, not giving any kind of medical advice But I want to have this conversation today, and I think that uh, many of my listeners and viewers can benefit from it. First, let's just start by explaining what narcissistic personality disorder is. It is a mental condition in which people have an inflated sense of their own importance. It's There's nothing wrong with having confidence, but people with this disorder have a really dysfunctional, inflated sense of their own importance, a deep need for excessive attention and admiration. You'll find them dominating conversations in the room, at a party, at a gathering, or at church. They're always dominating the conversation. They have troubled relationships and a lack of empathy for others. So there is power in educating ourselves because narcissists cause a lot of confusion and self-doubt. They will make people question reality. They will make people question their own sanity. And so it's super important that you become empowered about the narcissist in your life by educating yourself more about the disorder and how you can overcome in this relationship you're in and no longer be abused in this relationship you're in. So let's talk about traits of a narcissist so that you can be alert. Okay. These are narcissistic traits. And then we're going to talk about some coping tactics for you to deal with this relationship if it's a situation that you can't get out of or how to get out of the relationship. One thing you can always count on from a narcissist is they prioritize power over intimacy. They don't govern their relationships by love and respect, but by power. And so they are entitled to your love and respect, even though they are Uh, not keeping their end of the bargain, their end of the relationship. And they expect you to be subservient to their power and control. The hard thing about narcissists, really hard thing, is that you can see it, but they cannot see it. They have no self-awareness. It's what you call um, low emotional intelligence. They don't have the ability to see these traits Uh, in themselves, and they're not aware of the emotions of the people around them. They're kind of um, deaf to how they are making people feel around them. And so because of their lack of self-awareness and insight into their own behaviors, it is very hard and it's not likely that you will be able to show the narcissist what they're doing to the people around them and see a change in them. I've heard of a few narcissists changing, but you will rarely ever hear success stories of narcissists going and getting the therapy they need, taking their condition seriously and overcoming their narcissistic personality disorder. But if you are listening and you believe that you exhibit these traits, 
Um, I want to encourage you to please go seek therapy immediately from someone who is highly trained in the area of narcissistic personality disorder, who will not play games for you with you and who will help you get better and to stop harming the people in your life. They have no ability for self-correction uh, because again, they're not even aware that they're is a problem. And even when you bring the problem to their attention, there's no humility to self-correct. You have to have humility to self-correct. And one of the deeply ingrained um, traits of someone suffering from narcissistic personality disorder is that there is a, um, a disordered sense of self. And so there is no ability to humble themselves Um, or at least they don't choose to humble themselves and self-correct. Narcissists believe they are exempt from the rules, okay? The rules don't apply to them. They demand that you keep rules, and if you breathe or cough the wrong way, you're going to be called on the carpet, but they can uh, commit the most heinous infractions, and, oh, it's no big deal. Okay, I'm sorry. You forgive me. And, and they think it's it's that simple. Um, and it, again, they're exempt from the rules that they place on you. This is enough to drive a person crazy who's in a relationship with this person. And these are boundaries that have to be drawn by you. The same rules that apply to me, they apply to you too. You're not exempt from them. They're not going to like hearing that. You're going to get a... Uh, uh, a probably a rageful response when you begin to start setting boundaries like that in the narcissistic relationship that you might be in. It's never their fault with a narcissist. They never own up and accept responsibility for what they have done. And they always are able to turn it and make it your fault instead of their fault. They flip the script. Have you ever been in a conversation with a narcissist and you go in knowing this person has absolutely wronged me? This is wrong. And by the end of the conversation, the the script has completely been flipped and you're defending yourself and you're feeling like, did I do something wrong? And again, enough to drive you crazy. That, That is because they cannot accept, okay, I did this. This was wrong. I'm gonna humble myself and admit it. I'm sorry. It's never their fault. They have built such strong defenses around them. They're like a walled off fortress. And it's usually because of unhealed trauma in their lives. It is well known that narcissists often have suffered from childhood trauma that is unhealed. And it's like if they open up the floodgate of admitting this is their fault, (laughs) They think that they will be destroyed. They think that they will lose their power. So they choose not to allow vulnerability. Proverbs 12.1 says, whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. Did you know the Bible has the word stupid in it? It does. If you hate correction, you're stupid. And narcissists are stupid, ultimately. Like they can be um, intellectually smart, but emotionally, they're stupid. And again, they have n- very low insight into themselves. And they have come up with these tactics, these these coping tools for them. This is what their coping tools are of dominating situations, making them, themselves more superior, not worrying about how their actions are harming others, not having empath- empathy with them having grandiose, fascinating ideas, fictional ideas about themselves in their minds that aren't actually reality, but they live in that fiction constantly in order to form a reality that doesn't actually exist to make themselves feel better about themselves, to make themselves feel as grand um, as they want to believe that they are. They're always the victim always the victim. They can take a situation where they have done so much harm and it's so, so manipulative the way they turn themselves into um, the victim. Narcissists are always the victim. 
You can always count on them like clockwork to mistreat and abuse a person and then somehow make themselves be the poor victim in the situation. I hope you're listening. I hope you're thinking right now of different situations that you are in and realizing, oh, oh, that's what happened in that conversation. He's not the victim or she's not the victim. They just flipped the script on that situation. Now, it's kind of sad and I do pity narcissists because they are actually motivated by shame. Um, it's been found that they, they're they actually ashamed of their behavior and what they've become and what they've allowed to happen to their lives. Sometimes we get tricked by their shame and we think they're sorry, but they're not really sorry. They're sorry they got caught. They're ashamed of what's happened to their lives, but they're not actually sorry for what they've done to you because they have no empathy. So they are ashamed of what they've done, but then that shame turns to rage, narcissistic rage, and they become abusive. One of the key components of uh, the dysfunction with a narcissist is that they have a tremendous fear of being found out. They have a tremendous fear that you have information that you know they've been embezzling money or you know they've been cheating on their spouse or you know this or that is happening in the workplace or inside your church and they don't want to be found out. And so they will do whatever they can to control you and manipulate you and to keep you under wraps and make sure that you cannot expose them. That's when the manipulation, the bullying starts. That's when they begin to go out and get their what, what, what's called flying monkeys, people that they can dupe and hoodwink into believing their story. And they use their flying monkeys to become another bullying tactic against you to keep you quiet. And if you question a narcissist's reality, they, their, their fake reality, that the, oh, I'm a wonderful person. Oh, I'm a very accomplished person. I'm a very good person. When it's not the truth at all, they're abusive. If you question their fake reality, they will punch back with narcissistic rage. That rage is, is punishment and it conditions you and it trains you over time. You don't confront me. You don't mess with me and my false reality. If you do, this is what you get in return. Now, some rage um, in an overt way. I mean, they're hitting people. They're punching people. They're, they're very overt with their abuse. But most narcissists are covert narcissists because they're, they're playing a game, right? And they got to make sure that everybody, um, that they keep the game up and that they're not found out. And so their public persona is numero uno to them. They have to keep the public persona up. And so they can't put bruises on your face, which is what they actually, all of them actually want to do. They want to destroy you. Okay. They can't do that. And so they will go passive aggressive. Those are called covert narcissists. They, they feel the shame of what just happened and they have to have a punching bag. They have to take it out on someone. And let's say you say something about it or you try to establish a boundary or you confront them and what they've just done. Oh no, here comes the narcissistic rage, whether it's overt or whether it's covert, you're going to see it manifest in some way. Um, a person with money, they can abuse you financially. They can sue you endlessly. They can keep their income from you if they are, let's say, a spouse. Those are ways of being a covert abuser as a narcissist. Um, other forms of abuse, let's say you're married and um, if you haven't been intimate with your spouse for two or three days, they begin to give you the silent treatment and treat you cold and manipulate you so that they can get you to give them more of, of what they want. That is a form of covert narcissistic abuse. If your friend or family member is just always sucking from you, but never giving and they expect you to always give and they're always sucking, 
you know that you have got a problem. Um, some people call narcissists vampires because they are just, they are takers. They are energy suckers. And ultimately they have so little con to contribute. And when you're in a relationship with a narcissist, whether it's work, church, family, whatever, you often, part of their cover is they convince you that you can't live without them. They convince you that you need them in order to be successful. And it's so amazing to watch people leave those narcissistic relationships and actually find my life just got so much better, so much easier, so much more fulfilling. I actually did not need this person in my life. They are the ones who needed me. I was the one that was providing for them and making their life better. And all they ever did was take and suck for me. So let that be an encouragement to some of you who are considering, I've got to get out of this situation with this narcissistic boss or this narcissistic pastor or family member, whatever the situation is, spouse. But I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can live without them. I don't know if I can make it. Let me encourage you. You're not going to believe how much more fulfilling and at peace your life becomes if you are able to rise up and find the strength to create boundaries and demand that you be treated with some respect. Now, this may sound like a contradiction, but narcissists have very huge egos, yet they also have very fragile egos. And I know that sounds contradictory, but it's not. They construct a false self to protect their very fragile ego. The medical term for this is grandiosity. And grandiosity, having a, an inflated view of themselves, being so impressed with themselves and communicating that to others is actually like their suit of armor. It's their protection for what's really going on inside of them, which is a very low self confidence. So this is where narcissism gets so stinking confusing because it's like, how can someone be egotistical and abusive and also be ashamed and the victim? I mean, it gets super squirrely and confusing at times because they use their power to mistreat and abuse. And then they do this victim persona in front of everyone else so that you actually look like the abuser. That's a major part of their tactic is they make the victim appear to be the abuser. Oh man, it is all a show. It is all a show. So you'll find yourself walking on eggshells around this person if you're in close relationship with them or maybe this is your boss at work or someone you work with as a fellow employee or team member, you will find yourself very confused and walking on eggshells. And they always invalidate your pain and make light of your pain. And they will often decide for you what you're feeling. You'll hear them telling other people, oh yeah, she believes this and she thinks this. Or, oh, well, she already forgave me, so that's not an issue anymore. And you're sitting there listening. You know, you, maybe you're in a counselor's office, a therapist's office. Maybe you're doing marriage counseling. And this person's telling the counselor, oh, yeah, but she forgave me for that. And you're just sitting there looking at him like, I don't know. Maybe maybe I didn't. Maybe you're not sorry. You know, the verdict's still out. <laughs> Though You'll often find that a narcissist tells, decides for you what you have permission to to think and believe. And um, that's not fair. You have personhood. You're a person. You have feelings. Your feelings should be respected. You have boundaries that should be respected. And they don't have the right to tell you what you believe and what you think and what you're feeling. They don't have a right to make you question reality. But it's a very common tactic of theirs. Narcissists are emotionally unavailable. When they're in a crowded room, they'll say all these nice things about you and appear to be enamored with you. And behind closed doors, they're completely emotionally unavailable. Um, it's the cold shoulder. It's the silent treatment. It's manipulation and control. It's domination and power. And in time, you'll notice that they are keeping you at a distance because they're actually afraid if you get too close, you won't like what you see in them. Sometimes their distance is a protective mechanism because you're one of the few people in their life who actually know the truth 
about them. So they don't open up. They don't share with you their deepest, most intimate thoughts or feelings or concerns. They're very closed off. And so the intimacy always ends up being one way. If you're in an intimate relationship with a narcissist, the intimacy ends up being one way because they are incapable of being vulnerable. Narcissists talk a lot and don't listen. James 1.19 urges believers to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And narcissists are notorious for dominating conversation, for interrupting, for talking over you, and for not actually understanding you. Sitting and listening and trying to understand, okay, what is she saying? Why does she feel this way? What am I doing to make her or him feel that way? Narcissists also build their sense of worth by tearing your sense of worth down. They're oftentimes critical. Uh, They're going to be the person maybe sitting in the pew criticizing the pastor's sermon. Um, This is maybe the, the pastor who is jealous of someone's large following. And so they criticize them and nitpick everything they do. They are very critical people. Um, They're jealous. They're jealous that they haven't made of their life what you've made of your life or what others have made of their life. And they're always in competition with others, especially when they know ultimately deep down inside, they're not really superior, um, that, that you have something that they wish they had. And so this is the game they play. They tear down your sense of self-worth. Narcissists are very dishonest. They are notorious for being pathological liars. And this is really hard uh, to, to navigate because those, when you're an honest person, it's hard to believe someone will look you straight in the face and just lie through their teeth to you. And you, you can't relate and you can't fathom they would do that. And so you believe them if they tell you. That's what honest people believe people when they tell them things. And sometimes it takes years, 5, 10, 20 years of being lied to before a person figures out, this person has been lying to me all along, actually. Maybe you finally stumble across hard evidence that there is a lie. There is a contradiction here. This is an absolute lie. There's no way to defend this. And the narcissist, when confronted with it, denies it. Boom. Red flag. Huge red flag. Maybe there's been a lot of other lying going on that you didn't know about because you didn't have hard evidence. And so it's very important in these situations, maybe you're um, working with a narcissist, you need to keep documents. You need to document, document, document what's going on so that you can show the proof. And when maybe the narcissist tries to make someone think that you're the one who's lying, you can show, no, actually, here's the proof. They are the one who's lying, but they're very dishonest creatures. Um, Let's talk real quick about a biblical example of dealing with a narcissist. What does the Bible have to say about how to deal with people like this? What are the examples we have? What about in the relationship in 1 Samuel 18 with David and Saul? Okay, David was a young man who was serving his king, King Saul. David was a faithful servant to the king. He did nothing but make the king look good and do whatever he wanted him to do. And David was beginning to get a lot of respect among the people and he was eclipsing Saul. And Saul was jealous and actually tried to kill him. Hopefully most of you know this story, so I'm not going to actually read it. But let's look at what happens. David behaves himself wisely, it says in the scripture. And then it says that Saul becomes very jealous of him. Jealousy is the sin and the unclean spirit that starts this whole dramatic encounter and relationship and and really narcissistic battle um, that you see with David and Saul. Saul becomes distressed over jealousy from a person who is not even doing anything to harm him. He's doing nothing but being faithful to him and serve him. It's all internal inside of Saul. He becomes distressed. He becomes obsessed and possessed and determines, I'm going to pin him to the wall. I'm going to destroy him. I'm going to kill him. And 
right as David is in the middle of serving his king and playing the harp for his king, I mean, you would think that the king would see this as my faithful servant. No, King Saul is holding a spear in his hand and he thinks he's going to pin David to the wall with it and take his life. And it says Saul grows, David escapes twice from Saul's spear and attempt on David's life. And it says, what happens? Saul grows more fearful of David. Saul's the one with the spear in his hand. Why is he scared of little David who's got a harp in his hand? This is what happens with the narcissist. They become scared of the victim because the victim is, ching, 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 listen, behaving himself wisely. You must always behave yourself wisely. So here David is the one, the victim, and vulnerable to Saul's spear. Yet Saul fears David because it says in the Bible, God is with David and God has departed from Saul. Saul knows deep down inside that God has left him and God is with David. And now Saul is going cuckoo with fear and narcissistic rage. So let's look at what David does. All right, because this is the end and the crux of what I want to talk about. What do we do when we're in these narcissistic relationships? David disappeared. (laughs) He disappeared. He distanced himself. He ran. He went no contact. And if you've ever read any articles or insights on narcissism or watched any videos on narcissism, you'll know that they say go no contact as much as possible, or it's often called going gray rock not involving, not responding, not engaging, not saying, look what you've done to me. Look at this lie you told. They'll never admit what they did. It's, it's a totally useless and worthless and futile exercise for you to ever to get them to see the light. It it took me a long time and a long process to realize that narcissists will never see the light. And so you go no contact. You behave yourself wisely. When you behave yourself wisely, no matter what the narcissist does to try to accuse you, to try to claim you've done this, that, or the other, if they have no hard evidence, they're going to fall flat on their face. Behave yourself wisely. Stop trying to fix the narcissist. If you keep fixing the narcissist, they're never going to crash and burn. They're never going to be exposed for the abuser that they are. So you have to stop fixing them and you have to let the situation play out. It's one of the hardest things in your life to do, especially if you're a fixer and you're a person who can get stuff done. It's really hard to stop fixing the narcissist in your life. But that is the only way you're actually going to finally break through into freedom. And I'd say do what David did, if at all possible, and run from your situation. Get away from the narcissist in your life, if it is at all possible. Obviously, if you're a minor, you're a 12-year-old, let's say, and you have a narcissistic parent, you can't just run away. And so, again, only if this is applicable in your situation do you try to completely exit no, no matter how long you've been dating this guy or this girl, completely exit the situation now, no delay, full stop. You will never have intimacy with a narcissist. It's all a game. The thing you think you have, you don't have. It's not reality. It's all a game. And it's better now that you realize that than you get enmeshed into 20, 30 years of this, Okay. If you want intimacy and you want healthy relationships, you're healthy. You love this person. You're actually giving this person your all. And you can't fathom living without this person. You truly do love them. And you truly do sacrifice for them. But you will never be loved by the narcissist. And the quicker you wake up to that, the quicker your life is going to become a happier life. Create physical space like I'm talking about, like distance yourself, but also 
one of the hardest things is to create emotional and mental space from this person. You can leave a relationship and that person stays stuck in your head for years to come. If you do not decide, I am not going to let this person's abuse stay in my head. I'm not going to let this person's lies about me, gaslighting and projection about me stay in my head. I'm going to overcome that and I'm going to think true thoughts about myself. So don't only physically distance yourself, distance yourself emotionally and mentally as well. Um, Like I referred to earlier, document everything. If this is a boss, if this is a spouse, um, you have to document what's going on because you will not believe the gaslighting that happens. You will not believe how the thing that person is doing to you, they end up convincing so many people that it's you doing it to them. And then you're in a boatload of trouble because you didn't document anything. You didn't prove the time that this lie was told or this money was stolen or this extramarital affair happened. So make sure you're doing everything you can to protect yourself and to document. Forget about getting closure or empathy or apology from the narcissist in your life. You'll never get closure They'll never say, oh, you know what? You're right. I'm a terrible person. I was abusive to you. I repent. I'm so sorry. I'll never be that way again. And I'm going to issue a public statement to everyone who I've lied to you about that you were actually a wonderful, loving and giving and sacrificial person and that I was a scumbag. It'll never happen. (laughs) So I've done you a huge favor by um, letting you know you can walk away. You can walk away without that closure. David, he didn't do anything wrong to Saul, did he? Did he get closure? Nope, he didn't. You know where the closure comes? It comes when God's smile is on your life. God's vindication is on your life. His vindication and his approval is all you need. And David continued to walk a life of blessing and favor and God's vindication on his life. And that, dear one, is all you need is the blessing and love of the Lord. His banner over you is love. Do not believe for another second what your abuser is saying about you. His banner over you is love. Embrace his thoughts towards you. And don't worry about what the narcissist and his flying monkeys are believing and saying about you. That's a really hard one for me because I have cared what people think about me. But David did not waste time getting the closure, getting the apology, um, even though he never did anything for but, but good for Saul. So forgive your abuser, release your abuser, release him to the Lord. Don't try to fix them and don't try to understand what just happened to you. You must move on into the better life that God has for you. No matter how many people do not understand that process, you leave them in God's hands and you just be thankful to be left alone by them. Okay, there's 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 a high price on that, that you are just left alone by this abusive person. Insulate yourself and your children from becoming a narcissist by teaching them and living in front of them God's word, modeling for them Jesus' sacrificial love for his sheep, uh, teaching them how to live out the principles of Micah chapter 6, verse 8, live justly, show mercy, and walk humbly with your God. That's the best thing you can do for yourself and for your children is to teach them to live that way and to model that in front of them. Live justly, show mercy, and walk humbly with your God. I pray that something I've shared today is going to help many of you realize you're in a narcissistic relationship, break free from that narcissistic relationship. I hope that narcissists listening will go get serious help and therapy so that you no longer abuse the people in your life who actually are loving you and doing what's best for you. And I pray that all of you will share this podcast about narcissists. God bless you.